Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. We have been gandering through the looking glass to consider geologic foundations, ecological phenomena, interrelatedness between plants, animals, and their environments. This all takes on a new life as we consider how we humans like to extract some of the environment as it is shaped by weather sculpting these lands. We know about the biosphere and how it hosts plants with the aligned animals calling these climates home. Today, we look at how climates are interactive with landscapes topography, and weather delivery systems to shape how biospheres are created and sustained. Megaclimate systems cover every site by first passing all hurdles modifying its path. This goes far beyond plants living on these surfaces of the landscape. They are all interrelated. I want you to capture the delicate interactions between all the biotic and abiotic forces found across megaclimates, macroclimates, mesoclimates, and ultimately to the microclimatic locations we observe. Forces are recognized as happening at the megaclimate level, but ultimately, all interactions are related to the microsite level, happening one plant and animal interaction at a time. Remember, none of these players are inconsequential. You may never know when you needed one of them to save the entire kingdom. Climatic spatial scales describe the influence of climate on ecological phenomena. On a global scale, atmospheric motions transport heat from the tropics towards the poles. Atmospheric circulation patterns are of critical importance in determining specific climate of a location. Evaporation over the oceans supplies the water molecules that support precipitation over land. These circulation patterns are in large part driven by the energy differences between regions of the globe. Dry climates are associated with the descending branch of the Hadley cell, while moist climates coincide with the ascending branch. On a regional scale, precipitation on the lee side of a mountain is typically less than on the windward side. There are a lot of interactions to consider here, so let's break them into segments we can evaluate individually. Macroclimates are guided by megaclimatic forces as a means of energy transfer. It comes as direct solar radiation, as massive heat sinks carry moisture-laden energy packets, oftentimes as seemingly inconsequential cumulonimbus clouds. When packed by the jet stream, recycled through the Hadley cell, or mixed by the peripheral cell, energy distribution takes on the force of a game-changing shapeling. These four forces interact to direct how temperature, moisture, and light interact. Consider these concepts individually as we explore their interactions. We will explore the origin of air masses, latitude, continentality, and topography to see a new understanding. We begin this by looking at the origin of air masses. Developed in 1930, the Bergeron classification is the most widely accepted form of air mass classification, though others have produced more refined versions since then. Air masses are commonly classified according to four basic source regions with respect to latitude. Polar, cold, arctic, very cold, equatorial, warm and very moist, and tropical, warm. These are the base names, but you see them capitalized as we report them in two or three letter scripts. The prefix to these source regions tells us where these energies initiate. That informs about the energy power it holds. M is for maritime, C for continental. When it forms over the ocean, the energy is loaded with moisture carried in clouds. Those have high pressure and move where they fill the pressure gap. I offer you some confirmations about these air masses. Low pressure systems do not pull other systems into them. Mm -mm. There are no vacuums in the troposphere, although the weather may look that way. In reality, high-pressure systems force their way into, over, and sometimes under low-pressure systems. Weather systems that initiate over the ocean will carry evaporated moisture. It was heated, evaporated, and transported into cumulonimbus clouds, stacked throughout the troposphere at all three levels. These are expansive and powerful. In meteorology, an air mass is a volume of air defined by its temperature and water vapor content. Air masses cover many hundreds or thousands of miles 
and adapt to the characteristics of the surface below them. They are classified according to latitude in their continental or maritime source regions. Colder air masses are termed polar or arctic, while warmer air masses are deemed tropical. Continental and superior air masses are dry, while maritime and monsoon air masses are moist. Weather fronts separate air masses with different temperature or moisture density. Once an air mass moves away from its source region, underlying vegetation and water bodies can quickly modify its character. Classification schemes tackle air mass characteristics, as well as its modification. Keep in mind how these air mass systems interface as the climates change. When energy systems are loaded with precipitation energy, like in the summer of North America, the cloud systems carry forceful high-pressure energies. This is especially true at the interface of tropical and polar systems. A weather front is a boundary separating two masses of air of different densities. This is the principal cause of meteorological phenomena. Air masses separated by a front usually differ in temperature and humidity. Cold fronts may feature narrow bands of thunderstorms and severe weather and may on occasion be preceded by squall lines or dry wind gusts. Warm fronts are usually preceded by stratiform precipitation and fog. Weather usually clears quickly after the front's passage. Some fronts produce no precipitation at all, a little cloudiness, although there is invariably a wind shift. Cold fronts and occluded fronts generally move from west to east, while the warm fronts move poleward. Because of the greater density of air in their wake, cold fronts and cold occlusions move faster than warm fronts and warm occlusions. Mountains and warm bodies of water can slow the movement of fronts. When a front becomes stationary and the density contrast across the frontal boundary vanishes, the front can degenerate into a line which separates regions of differing wind velocity, known as a shear line. This is most common over the open ocean. Consider how these air mass systems interact with the winter. For our lives here in Pullman, the forceful moist maritime polar clouds coming from Alaska across the Cascade Mountains dropping a significant amount of precipitation as it does. Those cumulonimbus clouds were stacked through the low, medium, and high troposphere levels. Even though snow fell, those clouds were not empty yet. Think of the cold and dry continental polar air masses pushing into it. Maybe some continental arctic air masses join in? The continental air systems are dry and cold. Alaska-initiated maritime polar systems are filled with humidity. A mixing of systems happens, and deep snow falls. We see this in Missoula, with six feet of snow in a single storm. We get it in Pullman as temperatures drop to negative 20 Fahrenheit to freeze the three feet of snow dropped here. This happens when air mass systems interface. These air mass systems have been acting on this slice of the Pacific Northwest. It was blowing from Alaska over the Pacific Ocean and right up the Columbia River. Around 10,000 years ago, when glaciers retreated, outwash floods put in Lake Lewis to make that muddy slurry. Water seeped out and the silt was blown to the Palouse to make those highly productive less soils we all talked about earlier. We are still defining the macroclimate and know the power of those air masses to move clouds and fronts of energy around the globe. Position within the continent, known as latitude, is an expression of the site's juxtaposition in reference to the equator and poles. It carries relationships to the Earth's tilt and temperature impacts throughout the seasons. We just watched how the air masses are influenced by these temperatures, along with the movement of humid energy as clouds and the jet stream. Changes in pressure zones are most prevalent along this gradient. High pressure zones stand a blockade against some systems, while low-pressure zones fall easily to the changing weather patterns. Of course, latitude interacts directly with continentality. The major factors that determine global climate also influence climate on a regional scale. This is where they all come together. Regional climates are influenced by water bodies and mountain ranges. Lakes exert a moderating influence on local climate in a manner similar to how oceans affect the larger climate. 
The Great Lakes are a good example for demonstrating the impact of lakes on climate. The Great Lakes affect snowfall. The Great Lakes also influence the temperature of the region. The temperature over the water is often very different than the temperature over land. Exchanges of heat and moisture above the lakes is key to weather modification by the Great Lakes. The influence of large water bodies on the weather of surrounding regions is most marked when the temperature differences are greatest. Weather system deliveries happen through the confluence of climate interactions. We have looked at this before to name macroclimates. Even the naming of these climatological regions is broad recognition of the forces we have been discussing. Some areas are very dependent on the most controlling forces seen there, like the Arctic microclimates or humid subtropical. These are at the extremes, and in between, we see some more local control exerted by the shape of the land. We call that topography, the configuration of land surfaces. With that segue, we need to discover what I often call the game-changing event. Look to the microsite habitats created within these landscapes. Topography describes the physical features of the land areas. These features typically include natural formations such as mountains, rivers, lakes, and valleys. Man-made features such as roads, dams, and cities may also be included. This is Pullman, the land we know, and we can see the topographic lines to reveal how contours shape slopes on the flat map. Topography records the various elevations of an area aiding management activities. Landforms of the west are generally not flat, and where slopes form, the incidence of increased direct solar or diffused solar radiation happens. This means that although landforms may be adjacent, their photosynthetically active radiation levels are not the same. Topography is seen everywhere we look. Terrestrial landscapes have been modified since Pangaea was ripped apart and reassembled as a global jigsaw puzzle. When lands are horizontally pressured or vertically pushed, lands respond by reshaping. The texture may be called a mountain range, a lake, or a broad flatland. In all cases, these are expressions of topography. We begin articulating mesoclimates as we feel the texture of the land. We can recognize how eastern Washington, about 11 million years ago, was the receptor of those flood basalts. The basalt layers were poured as flat as a pancake. That is how basalt floods look like when they are piled two or three miles thick. The hardened basalt flows were heavy, pressing down on the lithosphere. They were horizontally pressured from the west by the Pacific tectonic plate, forcing against and under the continental plate. This shaped buckles, folds, and warped these lands. It is the rise and fall of the Cascade Mountain Range. Volcanoes have formed here rising above the sinking Pacific Plate as it enters the asthenosphere. These pressures made here are real. They shape the topography we see across the Palouse. We are hilly, something everyone on the WSU campus sees as we walk from one side of campus to the other. This shaped landscape alters the delivery of climatic forces. This topographic reshaping happens everywhere energy delivery is routed over hills, around rivers and lakes. The native vegetation of this macroclimate perpetuated certain plant communities. Those plants developed genetic adaptations to these lands. When the native grasses, sagebrush, rabbitbrush, and trees were removed to plant wheat, barley, canola, and lentils, the environments changed as well. As we look closer at Washington State, we recognize biomes. Lines on a map designate separation between these biomes. But still, there is commonality and disjunct habitats meandering from one to the next. You see this Pacific Coastal Evergreen Forest biome along the ocean shorelines. It extends from British Columbia to California. I know these landscapes, full of western red cedar, western hemlock, Grand fir, Douglas fir, and a host of sword fern and mosses in the understory. Why is this map view showing it 400 miles inland? <laughs> it's a printing error, right? Actually, this is a coastal disjunct biome appearing only a couple hour drive east from Pullman. 
Conditions are right to replicate the plant species common to that biome. Western red cedar dominates these landscapes. It is a lush vegetative habitat, commonly seen west of the Cascade Mountain Range. Huh. But here it is, on the west face of the Rocky Mountains, cresting over 5,000 feet elevation, 450 miles east of the Pacific Ocean shorelines. The Pacific Coastal Evergreen Forest disjunct is highly responsive to the rain shadow effect. It happens because of the marine polar air systems, loaded with clouds, heavy with precipitation, moving over the Cascade Mountain Range, then again to the Rocky Mountain Range. These biomes are separated on maps by lines, but on landscapes, the true realization of their complex structures is seen at the microsite level. We have been looking into air masses, latitude, continentality, and topography to consider how macroclimates, mesoclimates, and microclimates are shaped. There are other forces influencing plant and animal community development on each of these sites. Watch for the incidence of energy transfer to each site. It comes as direct or diffused solar radiation, precipitation as rain or snow. It also comes as a lack of precipitation or even humidity. These incidences shape the responsive nature of successful plant communities, thereby shaping how wildlife continue this energy transfer. Biomes are formed within this morass of changing faces for sunlight delivery. The big players are latitude and continentality, taking with the flavor of air mass systems delivering precipitation across topographic relief landscapes. Clouds are lifted to cool, and that drops precipitation. That is only part of this journey. So, I will continue this guided tour as we explore how factors of air masses, latitude, continentality, and topography all lead this unique discovery. Use this approach to consider lands you evaluate. Solar energy feeds these biotic and abiotic processes as they are modified by topography, geologic foundations, and responsive vegetation. All these come out from temperature which creates winds and dictates the delivery of moisture. It is not only from clouds that precipitation arrives. It comes through relative humidity, responsive to climate and temperature. When you need to distill the situation, look at temperature, moisture, and light. These come together to describe the microclimates where life is revealed. Sometimes the young tree growing underneath this overstory looks different to give example to the concept of succession. That comes soon, and for now, we circle back to microclimates like this one. We look to the southeast of Pullman, along the Columbia River. We stand on the northern Columbia River Basin microclimate, where the mesoclimate reveals the sagebrush, shrub, steppe the habitats. However, even amongst these nearest neighbors, we see vegetative differences with forbs and grasses at the ridgetop. Intermixed sagebrush, forbs and grass is lower, but still in the upper slope. Entering the lower slope areas, sagebrush, shrub, steppe, vegetation dominates. However, when getting lower on the topographic relief, Columbia River flushing has created a toxic saline soil complex preventing shrub success. All these interactions are dealt with at the sites of plant reaction. It ultimately happens at the microsite level. We will look closely into this Kamiak Butte site to put it into context of the Palouse Hills mesoclimate. While you look at this image, determine what type of clouds do you identify in this photograph. Those layered stratiform clouds seem to be carrying some moisture, making them stratocumulus clouds. Looks like they may be heading into that coastal disjunct interior wet belt forests of the northern Rockies. Hmm, I may be distracting you from our real journey. Back into the trek. What about the foreground of Kamiak Butte's scene? We are standing on the south-facing aspect, where direct solar radiation delivers intense sunlight for most of the spring and summer. This landscape is oriented to present a nearly perpendicular face to the spring and summertime sun. It gets hot, and the only tree able to thrive here is ponderosa pine trees. They can germinate and grow here, self-perpetuating. Even the shrub layer is limited to serviceberry plants, while grasses cover much of these landscapes. On the northern aspect, the story is strikingly different. While the south aspect is exposed to direct sunlight, the north aspect is oriented to the opposite direction. It is a north-facing aspect. 
Only for a few days each year is the angle of the sun high enough to shine directly into these landscapes. Topography makes significant differences between these two nearest neighbors, placed only a hundred meters apart. Keep that microsite analysis alive in your thoughts. We fly over the Cascade Mountain Range, staying at the same latitude, but continentality has moved from a 3 down to a 1 or 2. We are on the west side of the Cascades to see Douglas fir, Engelman spruce, western red cedar, western hemlock, and a load of understory plants like evergreen huckleberry. This is a lush vegetative scene capable of sustaining this old-growth forest. Look at this image to see which tails are lacking. No fire scar in this forest. Falling dead tree stems are not hanging in this forest. This seems stable and self-perpetuating. Plants thriving here are verdant, healthy, and well adapted to the environmental interface complex. We can call this a success story for this environment. All players are at equilibrium. Transpiration is the process by which moisture is carried through plants from roots to small pores on the leaf undersides, where it changes to vapor and is released to the atmosphere. Transpiration is essentially evaporation of water from plant leaves. The local transportation system is carried internally along the phloem and xylem. Plants use this transport system to move food, water, and minerals around. The function of the phloem tissue is to transport food nutrients such as sucrose and amino acids from leaves to all other cells of the plant by the translocation process. Movement within the phloem is bidirectional, while movement in the xylem is unidirectional. Xylem transports minerals and water from roots to the upper parts of the plant. This is how plants take in nutrients dissolved in water to enable specific growth in plants. Evapotranspiration is the sum of evaporation and plant transpiration from the Earth's land and ocean surfaces to the atmosphere. Evaporation accounts for the movement of water to the air from sources such as the soil, canopy interception, and water bodies. Evaporation occurs when water changes to vapor on either soil or plant surfaces. But transpiration is a plant process, referring to water lost through plant leaves. This is water that made it into the ground, was taken through the roots, and became part of plant life. The rate of evapotranspiration at any location on the Earth's surface is controlled by energy availability. The humidity gradient away from the surface, the wind speed immediately above the surface, and water availability. In light of this, we will drill into the photosynthetic process where plants convert sunlight into growth. They do it through energy conversion to integrate nutrients and water. Solar energy is transformed to a usable form of energy in plants and animals as it passes through the food chain. Visible sunlight falls on plant leaves to initiate photosynthesis. We will revisit this event soon, but the existence of solar radiation on a plant leaf is not enough to ensure photosynthetic responses. Plant activity needs more. Can you anticipate what that is? The energy the plants absorb from the sun is the energy supply for building of simple sugars that are then converted into starch for storage. Plants can store and grow through this energy transfer. When we eat plants, the stored chemical energy from the plant is transferred to us. This provides us with an energy store for all of our life processes such as growing, moving, making sounds, and breathing. All life is dependent on primary producers using the sun's energy. Transpiration is a process by which moisture is carried through plants from roots to small pores on the underside of leaves, where it changes to vapor and is released to the atmosphere. Transpiration is essentially evaporation of water from inside plant leaves. It occurs chiefly on the leaves while their stomata are open for the passage of carbon dioxide and oxygen during photosynthesis. These processes initiate transpirational pull by evaporation of water through the stoma. Capillary action plays out as adhesion and cohesion of water in plant xylem, with root pressure acting as osmosis of water into root cells. Surface water, warmed by the sun, evaporates and turns into vapor. 
It passes out through thousands of tiny pores called snovata, located mostly on the underside of leaf and needle surfaces. This is transpiration. It has two main functions, cooling the plant and pumping water and minerals to the leaves for photosynthesis. I keep dropping terms like transpiration, respiration, stomata, and xylem, hoping you already know or are learning what these terms mean. Understanding the significance of stomata captures some of the most amazing ecological phenomena we can experience every day. To illustrate, I zoom in on this grand fir. This is the underside of the tip of the branch. Those rows of white stripes are hundreds of thousands of tiny stomata where the plant releases moisture to the atmosphere. Plants need to keep the stomata as open as much as possible to obtain atmospheric carbon dioxide, but at the same time, they need to control the loss of water via transpiration. Therefore, plants actively optimize the status of stomata to gain as much carbon as possible, but not lose too much water. Transpiration is the process by which moisture is carried through plants from roots, through xylem, to small pores on the underside of leaves, where it changes to vapor and is released to the atmosphere. Transpiration is essentially evaporation of water from plant stomata. That is from high pressure in the plant to low pressure in the atmosphere. Gases enter and leave the leaf through stomata, which actively control the gas exchange of carbon dioxide and water between the plant and the atmosphere. Pairs of specialized guard cells form the stomata and control the opening of the small pore in between the guard cells. Plants physiologically control the opening and closing of stomata by accumulation of solutes in the guard cells. If guard cells are swollen, the stoma is open. The movement of water past the guard cells results in closing of stoma. Stomata react to changes in light intensity, air humidity, and soil moisture. We are walking the path to describe microclimates, but this necessitates a close look into how plants are responsive to environmental factors. We are jumping to Scandinavia, the University of Helsinki, Institute for Atmospheric Research and Earth System Science. The Finnish software company Simosol Oi and artist Riki Hapoya coordinated with the Institute to make Carbon Tree, an online app to describe how plant photosynthesis is responsive to factors measured at the microsite level. We can adjust the drivers for cloudiness, air temperature in Celsius, and air humidity. Adjust those sliders to increase and decrease each individually or in combination. The outermost part of leaves, the epidermis, protects plants from dehydrating. When they open, plants release moisture. You see those blue bubbles floating out through the stoma and into the atmosphere. However, plants also need to open their stoma to capture carbon dioxide. This gives trees ability to retain carbon used to build cellular structures. For every carbon atom it retains, the plant releases two oxygen atoms as one molecule. What a great trade for us mammals! We know how to take a deep breath in well-vegetated plant environments. That process is plant transpiration. Plants control it by regulating their stomata. They take up moisture from the soils, laden with nutrients like nitrogen, which they need to make chloroplasts in their leaves. Chloroplasts is where photosynthesis is enabled. Plants open the stomata and release some moisture and take in carbon dioxide. However, the plant needs to regulate how much moisture is lost. Plants close stomata to avoid losing too much water. Release too much water and the plant dries out. Then it dies. All is lost. You can see how plant regulation is paramount to success. The guard cells stand to attention to control this exchange through stomata. Cloudiness reduces, and the plants again photosynthesize more. Moisture release is increased. This has all been happening at 18 degrees Celsius, so let's take the slide temperature up a bit. More sunlight arrives for the plant. Look at the amount of moisture released. <laughs> it went up holding all other conditions constant. Now we leave the temperature high, but make it cloudy. Watch what happens. Full cloud cover and photosynthesis and transpiration slows. It, it virtually stops. 
Now, clouds are dissipated to 50%, and the plant factory opens again. Reduce cloudiness to 20%, and see more action through the stomata. I want to experiment with temperature. We have been doing this at about 18 degrees centigrade. I slide it up to 23 degrees, and more activity happens. We are assuming the plant has ample moisture available for more photosynthetic exchange. Lots of photosynthetically active radiation is captured as moisture is released. Atmospheric temperature affects how water molecules are conveyed into the air. Warm air can hold more moisture than cold air. When stasis is reached, plants transpire until an internal alarm sounds. That alarm is set because the plant is drying out. Plants close their stomata to reduce moisture release, and when they do, they take in less carbon dioxide. Now the temperature drops. It falls below zero. <laughs> Bang! The plant totally stops photosynthesizing. I'll stop. Photosynthesis shuts down if the temperature of the previous night has been lower than 5 degrees. Slowly we get above zero. Then at 5, then 10 degrees centigrade. A little more moisture starts to escape. Plant activity picks up at about 15 degrees centigrade. That is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a critical realization you want to capture. Think about those winter days in the Palouse. The sky is totally clear. The sun beats down on us all. But it is January 15, and the temperature is about 20 degrees below zero. Yep, it happens. And those plants are all shut down for the winter. No photosynthesis. No water release. All stop. Just having solar radiation does not mean the stomata are reactive to it. Everything is reactive to a wide array of input parameters. Everything needs to come in mass to reach equilibrium. Forces of nature assemble to create a vortex where life happens. It is the combination of the four big issues we have been walking through, but their combinations are unique dependent on realized environmental conditions. Topography is oftentimes a condition that overrides or accentuates the interchanging abiotic factors. Changes are shown when landscapes are tilted to increase or decrease solar exposure. We are looking at the confluence of the Snake River and Clearwater River at the joining of Lewiston, Idaho and Clarkston, Washington. The south-facing aspect shows flood basalts exposed where they have been cut by these rivers. Dominant marine polar air mass systems up this watercourse, and the responsive vegetation surviving and thriving here. We move over to Teton County, Montana, along the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains, to see how the continental polar air mass arrives, cold and dry, at this 4,000-foot elevation foreground, looking up to 6,500-foot elevation peaks. Topography has aligned an early morning east-facing sunrise that is partially lost in summer afternoon times. Vegetation established here supports photosynthetic activity, but it is responsive to the granitic subsurface geology. Cold climate, dry and cold dominating air mass systems. Recognize how microclimates are situated within subalpine mesoclimates each showing response to differing levels of solar radiation and elevation. These all show within the overriding subarctic macroclimate found here. In each environment, we can see how responsive biotic organisms are to the combinations made actionable. Topography has been highlighted throughout this discussion, but there remains a consistent and pervasive feature to influence energy transfer. We are located in the Pacific Northwest, surrounded by mountain ranges, oriented along a north-south alignment. The Olympic Mountains, Cascade Mountains, and Rocky Mountains each present modification to how marine polar air systems accumulate precipitation from the Gulf of Alaska to deliver it to coastal Washington, then across the West Cascades to gain more energy as it prepares its approach into west face of the Rocky Mountains. In the wintertime confluence of air mass systems, Continental polar and even Arctic polar dry and frigid air mass systems combine with our marine polar systems to rejuvenate into powerful systems of snow and blizzard activity. 
At each step, these energies are delivered one microsite at a time, and all in mass. We need to break this down on a profile view. A shows the Olympic Mountains. Air mass begins to cool over land. As this marine polar air mass system arrives, it is heavy with cloud-borne moisture. As it rises over land, especially along the western front of the Olympic Mountains, it drops rain. <laughs> a lot of rain. The whole rainforest receives about 12 feet of rainfall each year. That is 12 feet, not inches. That is 366 centimeters of precipitation each year. This is known as the rain shadow effect at initiation. But it goes further than this, because at Squim, Washington, located on the northeast side of the Olympics, less than 16 inches, 41 centimeters of rain per year falls leading it to give itself the nickname of Sunny Squim. Slide over to B. Mountains cause orographic uplifting of air masses, cooling as it is lifted to higher altitudes. Cooling causes condensation of water vapor, producing precipitation. More uplift accumulates at sea. Air mass reaches the top of the mountain range and begins to descend the eastern face, the lee side of the Cascade Mountains. The air mass is a fluid and has weight. So the descent is the function of gravitational pull of the air mass back towards the Earth's surface. Descending air mass passes D. The descending air mass warms. A warmer air mass is more capable of holding additional water vapor, resulting in significantly less precipitation. Clouds begin to take on a humidity load again. From E prime to E, the air mass reaches its lowest altitude and warmest temperatures of this segment. As the air mass continues its flow eastward across central Washington, it is gradually lifted again to higher altitudes because of the increasing land elevation. This is a process of movement along the continentality gradient. As the air mass continues to be lifted to higher altitudes, it cools and begins to precipitate at point E. Now, we notice vegetative responses to this increased moisture availability. The gradient shown at F reflects the region between points C and E, representing a region of reduced precipitation because of the greater capacity of the warm air mass to retain water vapor. This region is referred to as a rain shadow because of the significantly reduced precipitation as compared to what happened during the maritime polar air mass system's approach against and over the Cascade Mountains. The rain shadow effect is a significant abiotic energy modification system affecting how biotic life reveals. We see some consistencies related to these events, such as how elevation wrings water out of the sponge-like clouds on the advancing front with moderate temperatures and ample precipitation as they are pressured over the mountain ranges. This remains in equilibrium until the clouds are warmed and recharged with moisture and in the winter they are met by continental polar air systems with their dry and low temperature systems. This combination is where change happens. Storms are delivered and energies transform. We often call this a blizzard's birth, a windstorm, or even a firestorm event. I've been showing the effect of topography on how air mass systems deliver precipitation to the environment. But we need to keep this train of thought applied to how topography influences the way in which solar radiation is received at microsite levels. We are looking at Kamiak Butte from above, flying along the east side, looking westerly. You see dense forest trees on the right face and scattered trees on the left. It looks like a rain shadow effect, right? Well, no. This vegetative response is not the result of the rain shadow. The left side of this image is a self-facing aspect, and the right side faces north. Weather systems approach this mesoclimate landscape from the southwest. That is from the left and away from this vantage point. The marine polar air system embraces this region through a combination of approaches over the Cascades as we have just seen, and as high wind systems flowing up the Columbia River Gorge. You will remember those forceful winds that placed the Luss soils from the Wallula Gap over the Palouse landscape. That is where precipitation and winds come into this landscape. That means there is something else at play here to make this south-facing aspect hold a strikingly different vegetative conglomerate. 
aspect again makes the difference between trees on the north aspect and shrubs on the south aspect. Here, the climate is made tangible on a physical site because of how solar radiation is received. Solar radiation is delivered from the sun to these flat lands. The angle of approach flattens energy delivery to make the anticipated December and June warming moderated. But really, on our part of the globe, all lands seem to be affected by topography, making hills. Let's tilt this up. The angle of the land surfaces to the sun changes the angle of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface. If the land surface is tilted in some direction from level, the land surface becomes a slope and the degree of tilt and the direction of that sloped surface face alters the amount of solar insulation and its intensity. The angle of slope B places the land surface almost perpendicular to the incoming solar radiation. The direct insulation will increase, resulting in greater heating of the surface. If the aspect faces away from the direct beam of incoming solar radiation, as seen along slope C, less direct insulation it will reach the land surface, resulting in less direct heating there will be a greater dependence on reflected solar radiation, relying on indirect insulation from surrounding objects for solar heating and light. The lapse rate of non-rising air, commonly referred to as the normal or environmental lapse rate, ELR, is highly variable, being affected by solar radiation, convection, and condensation. Relative humidity is expression of these forces. It averages with a temperature lowering of 6.5 degrees centigrade per kilometer or drops 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 foot in the troposphere. We know that all things being held constant, that as you climb the mountain, it becomes colder the higher you climb. A temperature inversion is the reversal of the normal behavior of temperature in the troposphere. This happens when a layer of cool air at the surface is overlain by a layer of warmer air. Under normal conditions, air temperature usually decreases with height. Inversion is ELR being reversed. The warm inversion layer acts as a cap and stops atmospheric mixing. Inversion layers are called stable air masses. Temperature inversions are a result of certain weather conditions in an area. They occur most often when a warm, less dense air mass moves over a dense, cold air mass. We are balancing abiotic factors influencing how energy is delivered and balanced at the microsite level. Weather systems, rain shadow effect, underlying geologic forces, and climate come into an energy nexus where plants can thrive and survive. Essentially, the energy powerhouse to the planet Earth is how these are all activated. This is especially true at Kamiak Butte. Give attention to the angle of the sun as it touches the butte. In March, the angle of the sun is low in the sky, but the slope of Kamiak Butte presents its southern aspect lands into an almost perpendicular profile. The effect is to give an early season environment where solar radiation gives these sites a jump start to growth. All through the growing season, when temperature is within the range of growing, this site is photosynthetically active. That activity does overload as soil moisture becomes scarce and plant guard cells close to mata. It becomes hot early in the season and the plant growth is suppressed. Plants need their overnight temperatures to stay above 5 degrees centigrade for the following days to initiate growth. Give attention to the north aspect, that blue bar, to think about how much solar radiation is delivered to these north-facing macrocytes. It is less than their neighbors to the south. What do we see there? It is where Douglas fir, western larch, and ponderosa pine trees flourish. They receive less direct solar radiation, but it is delivered at equally high abiotic temperatures. Heating of a land surface by solar radiation strongly affects microclimate temperature regimes. Higher temperatures affect the moisture regime by increasing evaporation of water from surfaces, increases the transpiration by plants, and promotes convective air movements, all of which tend to make the microenvironment drier. Moderate the effect on the north-facing microclimate, and you see how this limiting factor has encouraged plant growth and diversity. 
We have been walking an array of abiotic factors influencing microsite conditions, but there is still another feature to consider. It comes as air mass systems arrive, but it persists as wind forces. On the south aspects, winds carry the heat initiated by direct solar radiation. This causes a direct plant response to close their stomata to prevent excess water vapor loss. In the process, it also reduces plant photosynthesis and its intake of carbon dioxide, extraction of carbon into the plant, and its release of oxygen into the atmosphere. Many conifer tree species like Douglas fir and western larch cannot compete against the better accustomed species like ponderosa pine, grasses, and steppe vegetation on these sites. Thus, vegetation communities on Kamiak Butte at Point B are shrubs and grasses, with scattered ponderosa pine trees, while the communities at C are higher density tree communities and vascular shrubs, including even ferns. Topography will determine the amount of solar radiation that will reach the land surfaces. This is insulation, and be transformed to thermal energy. The amount of insulation directly determines the temperature regime which will influence the status of moisture regime through the rate of evaporation, transpiration from plants, and depletion of water in the soil. Greater solar radiation delivery leads to higher thermal energy loads, higher rates of evaporation and transpiration, and greater depletion of water storage in the soil. These processes are powered by the combination of solar radiation, thermal residence, relative humidity, and plant community insulation. Consider what happens when one of these powerful sources is removed. Huh, the sun sets. Solar radiation is put off, and the wind direction changes. While the ELR shows a temperature drop the higher we climb, without sunlight powering this service, the wind direction shifts from daytime blowing up the hills to a downward cold temperature flow. This is the diurnal downslope wind change. Diurnal mountain wind systems are local thermally driven wind systems that form over mountainous terrain and are produced by the buoyancy effects associated with the diurnal cycle of heating and cooling of the lower atmospheric levels. Due to its high spatial and temporal variability, the planetary boundary layer, PBL, Behavior over a mountainous terrain is more complex than over flat lands. The fast-changing local wind system directly linked to topography and the variable land cover that goes from snow to vegetation have a significant effect on the growth of the PBL and make it challenging to predict. Understanding the process inducing changes in the mountain PBL have critical implications for predicting air pollution transport, fire weather, and local intense thunderstorm events. Photosynthetically active radiation, PAR, is the amount of light available for photosynthesis, which is light in the 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength range. PAR changes seasonally and varies depending on the latitude and time of day. This responds to all energy delivery factors at microsites. PAR levels are the greatest during the summer at midday. Factors that reduce the amount of PAR availability to plants include anything that reduces sunlight, such as cloud cover, shading by overstory vegetation like trees and buildings. Air pollution also affects PAR by filtering out the amount of sunlight reaching plants. Hmm, why is photosynthetically active radiation important? Photosynthetically active radiation is needed for photosynthesis and plant growth. Higher PAR promotes plant growth, and monitoring PAR is important to ensure plants are receiving adequate light for this process. Talk about these differences and why this is happening here. Why it happens like this. Notice I just recommended you talk about this? PAR changes seasonally and varies depending on the latitude, time of day, and the land's topographic exposure. Daily, it is driven by aspect, latitude, elevation, clear sky incidents. Consider the impacts of time on this landscape. When you see this evidence on this site, what does it lead you to understand about the current status of PAR delivery in respect to what it once was? It seems there is still another abiotic factor we have not articulated. Hmm, is the power of time. How does that force change microsites? 
Douglas fir trees growing as a plant community. Change the site to where sunlight, moisture, energy, and favorable plant conditions are met. That change led to measurable physical site characteristic differences. It is seen in these overstory plant species and in the conditions facilitating diverse plant growth. When you are on Kamiak Butte, look for areas like this one to see what plants are growing here. Do this analysis on every site you approach. Discover what the differences between these sites were founded on. It is not a matter of good or bad. It is how plants thrive and survive to optimize their individual successes.